I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. What kind of power can a World Series ring wield? Think of it like this. For nearly a century, no sports franchise dealt with more frustration and heartache than the Boston Red Sox. The brand was known for the famed curse from the deal that sent Babe Ruth to the Yankees and a bouncing ball that squeaked under the glove of Bill Buckner. Sure, the Red Sox had Fenway Park and the Monster and Pesky's Pole, but you don't play games to dance in the shadows of your competitors. And you don't sell tickets that way either. You play to win and winning sells. The best marketing campaign is a World Series victory. <laughs> That's Adam Grossman, the CMO of the Boston Red Sox, one of Major League Baseball's most iconic, prideful, and long-tortured franchises, but also one of the most popular, and in recent years, one of the most successful in the wing column and in the marketing world. Adam joined the club in the spring of 2004, just before the club's run of four championships over a 16-year window, and just before Kurt Schilling's bloody sock helped them win their first championship since 1918, breaking that famed curse. And during that time, the club's image has changed dramatically, from lovable losers to perennial champions. While success on the field plays a big role, sports franchises are responsible for their own brand. And when you're the Red Sox, being entrusted with that brand is a major responsibility. On this episode of Marketing Trends, Adam breaks down the ins and outs of stewarding a sports club's marketing efforts, how baseball must continue to reinvent itself to appeal to a younger generation, and why managing the customer expectation outside the ballpark is a growing challenge. Enjoy this episode. Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. We bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com slash marketing. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Ian Faison, host of Marketing Trends. And today we are joined by special guest, Adam. How are you? Great, Ian. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on the show. Uh, sitting there, uh, not necessarily in the cheap seats, but uh, but right behind uh, the monster. Um, Adam, excited to chat all things Boston Red Sox. Uh, we're going to talk Fenway, uh, your background, and of course, marketing. So how'd you get started in marketing? Well, I uh, my, my first role i consider my first role in sports was uh, actually i was I went to duke university and um there was as part of a classroom project started working with the durham bulls um on a uh, an inner city little league and so a friend and i sort of took this classroom project and for the last three years of our college career and then even afterwards even while i was an intern here at fenway and he ended up uh, at the White House. We were still kind of grinding on this project. We were just we were raising money for uh, to restore and and renovate two fields in, in Durham. And it was a time for us where it was like where it was really interesting because we could see, and at least for me, knowing that I was such a huge baseball fan and really wanted to pursue this as a career, to see how the connection between like a brand like the Durham Bulls there and sort of a sports team could have a social impact, but also, you know, we were hustling. So there was a lot of marketing in terms of trying to raise money, which we raised around, it was a $500,000 project. So we had raised about $300,000 in cash. And, you know, we just, it was a great learning and education experience and being able to work with the Bulls and, you know, parent coaches, the Durham and the organization down there was, was remarkable. So from there, I was able to get an internship with the Red Sox, and uh, I started working actually in baseball ops in 2002, right when John Henry, Tom Warner, Larry Lakino purchased the team. It was about six months after that. Uh, I started working for this guy who was the assistant GM at the time named Theo Epstein, and also there were Jed Hoyer and Ben Sherrington, and then also the same day that I started another intern a guy named Ami El Sade who's now the assistant GM of the Diamondbacks started as well and you know it felt like at that time it was a startup it really felt like it was sort of this it had a startup feel a startup mentality a 90 year old iconic history but it felt like just sort of a spaceship that was about to, to take off in some way um, you know and and as a 22 year old you know, lover of baseball that sort of just stumbled into this, you know, you couldn't ask for a better environment. 
And so I was there for, for several months um, in baseball ops. And then Lakino, who was the CEO, uh, needed somebody to work in his office. So I, I was there. I, uh, I remember talking to Theo about it. And I said, uh, I said, you know, Larry needs me to, to go over there. And he's like, you know, it should be a great opportunity. And he's like, when is your internship? And, and I said, well, it ends uh, on October 31st. And he goes, let me just give you a piece of advice. He goes, if you can stay with this organization on November 1st and still have an internship, he's like, I guarantee you, you can stay here the rest of your life. And that pretty much is, it's almost what's happened. Um, yeah. So I, I was, I worked in Larry's office for a number of years as his special assistant. But I think for me, what was eye opening with Larry was just, you could see across the organization and, you know, you, whether you were working on business affairs and business initiatives or community initiatives or baseball operations, you know, you sort of had this 30,000 foot view um, and this ability to kind of see across different groups. And I think from a marketing standpoint, that was a, an incredible training just to sort of see how these puzzle pieces fit together and how we were building programs and initiatives and sort of connecting these um again, these groups to, to really export the brand and really build, build something meaningful. And so, yeah, in, in 2018, I was uh, fortunate enough to be, become the, the VP of marketing. And that sort of was my, my entry into marketing. Although we also had a, a saying, you know, Lakino was great. And he always said, you know, we're all salespeople, but I think we also said we, you know, we're all marketers too. And I think that's one thing that that has continued with our organization that, you know, obviously the, the best, the best marketing campaign is a world series victory. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, we all look a lot smarter uh, when the team is winning, but just in terms of, you know, the type of team, you know, the leadership uh, that we have, you know, and, and how you define marketing. I mean, we always talk about yeah, having a, um, you know, a, a day of game employee who can make or break an experience of a parent or a child who's coming yeah. to Fenway is also its own marketing, you know, and it has nothing to do with ROI and data analytics and digital content, but experientially, you know, that's what we're, we're all about. So there's so many levels to it, but sort of the core principles for us felt like they've, they've stayed the same even since uh, I joined in 2002. And I, I, uh, I saw the Duke, we have a, an avid Duke, uh, listener. Uh, so shout out to captain, uh, Kevin Cumley and who, who listens to the show and teaches marketing at West Point, who's a dyed in the wool Duke person. So I'm sure he's, he's going to be listening along, uh, to this episode, but, um, uh, what does it mean to be CMO of the Red Sox? What, what do you work on? Well, for our group, we oversee a lot, sort of all the outbound efforts and kind of the, the external facing communications initiatives and, and brand um, and our connection to fans sort of outside of the, the ballpark. So our communications, you know, on the corporate side, baseball up and, and our baseball um, media relations, also social media, digital content, broadcasting, uh, our creative services, you know, it, all photography. I mean, it's sort of when we talk about content and especially where things have, have gone and shifted, you know, over the last decade, but certainly in the last <laughs> accelerated in the last year of just say how important uh, our, our digital content and connection to our fans, not only, you know, here in Boston, New England, but throughout the country and, and the world. So, yeah, again, that's, that's a lot of uh, our, our, our central focus. But, you know, then obviously we work with our, our partners and other departments within the organization to make sure that we're amplifying their work and efforts. I mean, even in this past year, which has been an incredibly challenging year for the organization, I know it's been so hard for everyone, but certainly our business and industry has been impacted this year like, like no other. But, uh, you know, we're really proud of what our our operations team and how the, the ballpark continues to function as it relates to, you know, we've the first time, you know, again, the ballpark's over a hundred years old, almost hundred, almost 110 years now. But the first time we've had, you know, Fenway has been an early voting site. Wow. And the first time we have a, you know, we're running a, a vaccine um, center right now where over 55,000 people have, have come to get vaccinated and, 
you know, we've always talked about Fenway as a community pillar, as a community resource. And even at a time when we haven't been able to have fans watch baseball and sort of in the, the principal <laughs> function of, of Fenway, we've been able to, to do things that are really extraordinary. And, you know, Sam Kennedy, who's our CEO, you know, has that sort of holistic mindset and Jonathan Galula, who's our chief operating officer and oversees the, the ballpark and Pete Nesbitt and Sarah McKenna, they're, they're incredible team that have really looked at how we can re-engineer and reimagine the ballpark, even at a time when it's sort of an in, inconceivable uh, episode here over the last year. Well, you know, it's so it's such an interesting position uh, from a marketing perspective, because, you know, we always talk about like in marketing, you always want to kind of like fight where you can win, which is kind of like always, always talk about the things that you're the best at, right? And you have this asset in Fenway Park that is one of the best venues to watch a, watch a game in the world in any sport has been around so long. You have this brand that's, you know, won uh, championships that's globally recognized. And then you also have the players. Like you have these, uh, whether it's people who have gone through the organization that are like the legends of the game, or you have the people that that are currently on the team. So it's kind of this this three pronged challenge that you that you have, uh, and you get to build an actual you know experience. But that experience has to extend digitally now in a way that you know Paul. One of the great things about uh, sports is you know going to the game, getting the hot dog, you know uh, having a catch, bringing your glove, you know all those things. Um, but but digitally, how can you recreate some of those things? So. I, you know, just from those different assets that you look at, your portfolio, how do you think about kind of like marketing those different pieces? Yeah, you know, a lot of up until this point, a lot of it's been, you know, again, how are we sort of, and we've seen this just with the engagements and, and you know, and again, we're highly focused on, you know, when we look at our, our data and digital content, it's like, how do we, how in terms of measurements, it really is engagements and especially in specific, some specific segments, but the idea of you know what we felt intangibly is exciting at Fenway, we know was going to blow up on social or in digital. You know, like again, you know, you have a historic run of 2018. Our numbers are going to go way up, um, and you know, even we saw this with retirement ceremonies, iconic moments. I mean, you just it complements, amplifies, and really connects people. Because every year, you know, every game, you know, we'll have maybe 38,000 fans for a sellout. But when you look at the millions of people who are on our social channels, you know, it's our ability to sort of bring them in into that experience and into that window, especially at our highest moments. That is something that we we feel it's so important to do that. And like we talked about, again, in our great season, like we got to bring people on this ride because there are special times and we've got loyal fans all over the world that are so dedicated game in and game out. And we, and again, now that we've got the technology and, and the relationships too, you know, that's one thing that's changed quite a bit. When I, I came back to the Red Sox FSM in, in 2012, and we were really trying to ramp up our social efforts. And at that time, you know, there's a different group of players that just wasn't as comfortable with social and with, you know, photographers and, and um, you know, social media crew sort of in the clubhouse and just sort of like, you know, by the batting cages. You know, nowadays, it's something that a lot of the players covet. You know, they want the content. Yeah, of course. They want their brand built. You know, we want to do that for them. You know, player marketing is there's no more important marketing initiative than making sure that our fans connect with our players and, and have a, an understanding of, of who they are and their personalities in addition to the incredible talent they have on the field. So that's something that has definitely transformed over the last several years and the relationship building and the trust that we have with the players is, is critical. And, you know, we've over the last couple of years, certainly last year we had an initial MLB allowed the, the teams to start miking up players on a local level. And, oh, yeah. you know, even in a, in a limited time, because we only had 30 home games last year, I think there were 16 or 17 games where we had somebody miked up during the game. And, 
you know, that is for content um, and for sort of a broadcast experience. It's so critical, you know, it's so critical. And then, you know, baseball, um, I think it's done a good job. I think there's ways that we can improve, but like that experience for fans is so important and fun and interesting. And, you know, those are the boundaries that we have to, to push and you start to see it. So, you know, we talked about sort of this experiential level, but also, you know, on the broadcast, how we're, complementing that on social on digital channels and sort of creating this this ecosystem where you know fans can get what they want on the channels that they want you know on their own time and i think that's something you know in addition to the games that we're obviously highly focused on yeah i remember back in the day going to a's games and uh and like you know part of the reason why you'd go to the game so early obviously batting practice and all that stuff but like the the players would like race uh, like RC cars like around the bases and do all sorts of stuff like that. And I think those type of like getting to know who the people are, getting to know, you know, having the players be out in the community and then, you know, the extension of their their brand and their personalities on social media now, like you fans can connect with players in a way that they they never have been. And it's, you know, it's right, you know, it's right with them just like any social media is. And I'm curious, like, you know, you hear all the time kind of like sports media talk about, oh, this group really wants a a franchise player because it helps put, you know, butts in seats and things like that. Is that something that you think about as a CMO? Like, is it something like, you know, hey, this person is a budding superstar, not just on the field, but like a budding superstar talent um, that can connect with fans in a new way? Yeah, I mean, we certainly from a marketing standpoint, you know, the guys, the, and the player personalities and understanding those. And, and, you know, we're always talking about how we're putting them in the best, the best light and what's most comfortable for them. So, you know, if they're not interested in something to put them into that category, it doesn't make any sense, any sense at all. You know, if, if you have a player that's interested in, in, um, you know, like JD Martinez, like loves fishing. Yeah. You know, and that's a big focus, big hobby of his. So, Hey, you want to do fishing? Like we'll be there. Like, let's, let's go. Um, but you know, if, if it's funny, we, last week, um, we did this for the first time, um, our Red Sox production team and, and Nesson looked at, uh, we had a night practice and we had sort of like an all access one hour night practice. So our fans could just hear, you know, our guys like, you know, they're taking BP, they're talking to our announcers back home. And, you know, it was almost sort of like an all-star game workout feel, you know, and you, you heard JD Martinez and Alex Verdugo sort of jaw back and forth about each other's style, you know, and, and like that kind of stuff, like it's, it's fun. And a guy like Verdugo, it was incredible last year. I'm really excited. Like he's a guy that loves content, loves to be a focal point, you know, really enjoys, um, you know, enjoys being featured like that for us. That's, that's amazing. Not everyone's going to be that way. And, you know, you can't make somebody who, who they're not. And certainly, you know, going to Heim Bloom and Brian O'Halloran who are making and, and Raquel Ferreira and Eddie Romero, who are sort of our GMs and the leadership of baseball ops. They, uh, they are not as interested to hear from a marketing standpoint, uh, what our <laughs> analysis is on, on players, which is probably a, a good thing. Thing. um because you know and for fans it's a good thing too because you don't want marketing people making baseball operations decisions but it is helpful uh for us to know you know w again who they are what they're all about we we work a lot with their agents as well to see you know just how as an organization we can help export their brand because it is an opportunity for these players while they're here with a diehard fan base and an iconic venue, you know, how they can use the platform, whether it's for brand building, marketing initiatives, or community programming, which is so important for us as, as well. So, you know, again, for us, it's about how we can put our guys in the best possible light, given their, their interests. And, you know, the bigger the personality, the, from a marketing standpoint, it's great, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, they got to be comfortable. Yeah, no, I, that's a great point. And, it, and it's cool to hear, you know, that, that working with the, um, with the agents, because I think that that is, you know, you see this, I'm a Golden State Warriors fan. You see this with, um, 
with the Warriors uh, being this like destination place for a lot of people, not just because of the winning culture and the championships and, and things like that, but because of what you get when you're in the organization, right? To be a destination organization means that you know, the marketing people can help you You work with your agent to, uh, to develop your brand, to get it in front of more people, to, you know, training staff and all that sort of stuff. I mean, marketing is an asset for these players that potentially not every team, you know, thinks about. Does, does every team have, uh, you know, have a, have a CMO uh, that is thinking about these type of marketing things? Or is this something that that you're trying to, you know, really push the uh, push the the limits to see what what marketing can be as it relates to to sports teams. Yeah, I think all the teams have marketing, you know, marketing leadership and, and and strong marketing leadership. And I think what's sort of interesting from a marketing standpoint, you guys, you know, know this given what you're doing, and just the world of marketing has become so much bigger and broader. And so I think. The challenge for the teams and the league, and you know, we're starting to work much more together with the league as well. I think as as clubs, you know, especially coming out of this time, is you know, how do you just where do you put your resources? Because we're not, you know, the, for those that that don't know, front offices are not that big. Um, you know, we don't have massive massive resources on, on the marketing side or just like massive amounts of, of people and the brands are huge and the players are big. And, and there's obviously a lot of, there's a lot of connection, but the infrastructure is always taxed and challenged, which in some ways, is, you know, is, is a, is a good thing because you can be really efficient and smart about your resources. But I do think, you know, again, I, I can't speak to all the other teams, but I know, you know, the, the, the player marketing side, digital content side, you know, just on sort of, we always talk about kind of like the arts and the science of marketing and, and they're both becoming more important, you know, not only in terms of just getting great content and sort of in making sure that we're projecting with the players, but, but also like, you know, okay, once we have that, you know, how are we cutting that content up? How, you know, how are we, are we putting paid against it to, to boost it? Are we following those viewers? You know, how are we trying to sort of leverage those as, as ticket sales initiatives and sort of create this connection, sort of more an increasingly strategic connection to fans uh, for revenue generation? So, you know, that's where I think the the trends are certainly going and the sophistication at all levels, I think, you know, over the last, since, certainly since my time here, you know, has grown in leaps and bounds. Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's really fascinating. And I think this is kind of one of the, we, we actually talked to a decent amount of marketers that kind of are in a similar position where you have a CMO who has like a global brand, but they don't have, you know, the thousand person marketing team that, that other organizations would have or, or something like that. But you have these, this like premier asset. So partnerships are very important. Sponsorships are very, very important. Developing, you know, um, relationships with with different orgs can you talk about like like i know you, you know you've you've used um you know you've had movies shot at fenway in the past um you've had uh, a, a partnership with uh, john krasinski some good news come about like how do you think about partnerships those are a little different you know the, the corporate partnerships we're we're lucky we've got a lot of um you know blue chip brands in this area that are incredible partners and we from there's a couple of things that we've got sort of again these corporate relationships bank of america dunkin donuts new balance beth israel john hancock i mean some real important iconic brands who for us are amazing partners I mean, we've got over 150 of them on on the red sox side and you know they there's a revenue component to that you know it's a it's an important revenue stream from for the, the business itself. And, you know, obviously from a business standpoint, you know, we need to make sure that we have a thriving business to ensure that we can provide the quality product on the field and pay players and player development systems that we need, you know, to, to win championships. And that's, that really is, is the goal. From a marketing standpoint, you know, these partners are brand extenders for us as well. Totally. You know, just, and again, that's sort of a two-way street, you know, they're, they want to hook up with us and leverage the, um, you know, the interest and the, the assets um, 
on whether it's advertising or digital that, that we provide to them, but also, you know, just the, for us, I mean, we're getting into their employees. They're, you know, it's a part of a, again, this, this sort of corporate community uh, connection yeah. that is so vital. And so, you know, when we look at those partnerships and, and True Parkinson is, runs that uh, for, for us, you know, we're looking at it from, okay, you know, you've got advertising and visual assets, you know, within the, in the park and, and content assets digitally, but also you know, community programming. I mean, we've got incredible youth connections with, with CVS, you know, New Balance is a, is an incredible local partner and, you know, they work with, Becca Saulwasser who runs our foundation and they're the title of the, the run to home base and um, which you know focuses on the invisible wounds of war of those who are who have served in the military. And I mean it's just it's an extraordinary group and you need all of it to really leverage the true potential that exists between these, you know, these these blue chip corporations. And so, you know, for us to be able to to align with those types of partners is is incredibly valuable. And I think it's becoming more and more valuable as time goes on. And again, you know, over the last year is that, that our brands, you know, we're fortunate to have these popular brands, but we always need more and you need different platforms and you need to be able to reach people again, especially now wherever they are. Yeah. And especially when we start looking at next gen and, and, and also they're critically important. Going back to the, the, the movie side, we've been able, you know, Fenway has been the home of, um, you know, Field of Dreams, Ted, um, the town, you know, some fever pitch. I mean, there's been some, some great, great films shot here. And uh, Colin Birch, who I work closely with, is, has been kind of our, our movie guy. Um, and, you know, we'll get, we'll get calls and say, Hey, you know, we, we need a week or two weeks. And, you know, we're, we're, it, it's been, it's been fun. And it is, again, the, the, the brand extender there to kind of be in these, in these movies, like it, it just sort of creates this, this destination feel, you know, and, and that's one of the things that for those who haven't been to Fenway, I mean, even if you don't like baseball, it's worth coming to Fenway. And I think that's, what's so great about some of these places that are, sort of these these cathedrals that even if you're not a huge fan of a sport or, or sports, they're beautiful destinations unto themselves. And and I think those those extensions on the movies have kind of magnified that. Yes. Yeah, so you mentioned kind of like working with your partnerships team, working with sales. Do you kind of have a piece of a traditional CMO role there where you're working with sales to like, you know, drive sponsors to the business, do that sort of stuff. Like what does that kind of motion look like? And then, you know, on the other side, in terms of like merchandise and, and selling season tickets and, you know, selling jerseys and all that stuff. Do you work with those teams that are doing that stuff? Do you oversee kind of the, the digital uh, motion and, and paid ads and things like that to, to those pieces as well? Yeah. So the way things are structured with baseball you know, is, is all about rights and sort of who has the rights to what revenues. And so the clubs have are really focused on driving local revenues within our within our market. So that's New England and uh, including Connecticut outside of Fairfield County. And that's our, our territory. And so when we're driving the business, what we're doing is looking at our biggest revenue streams, which are, you know, ticketing mm -hmm. and sponsorships and trying to figure out how we can how we can drive and leverage our assets to to drive those revenues. On the merchandise side, we have a, a great partner with with 47 brand, which is uh, you know they're right across the street. And but the the really the merch really sits at the league level and is more of like a national a national piece. And so oh interesting. And it's different like with Liverpool as an example you know, when Fenway Sports Group owns Liverpool and, and John and Tom, um, you know, over, oversee and Mike Gordon oversee the Fenway Sports Group. So with Liverpool, they are in the merch business. They also don't have territory. So when you're looking at, Interesting. you know, English Premier League, like you're not gated by a certain territory, like the world is your territory. And so what's so interesting there is like when you're getting in like their kit deal now, um, you know, Nike is their kit supplier. And so they're looking at it on a global basis. And, you know, whereas at MLB, the league is looking at that on a, on a global basis uh, or a national basis, more so than the team specific. Now, again, having said that, you know, 
we need to push merch and want merch. We, you know, it's, we want to see that be everywhere. So it's important for us from a sort of a global marketing standpoint, but as a direct revenue stream, it's shared amongst the, the leagues. So just going back to the, on the revenue side for the territories, what we do is, you know, how we've sort of thought about from our marketing efforts is we, we need to be part of the revenue function. You know, it's, it's, it's imperative that we are, and we may not be on the direct sales side of things. You know, we're not calling, you know, uh, season ticket holders or group sale, but what we are doing is trying to provide the resources, the data, um, and also work with our strategy group. So who oversees that, you know, strategy and analytics and marketing and our sales team to really put together the targets and the campaigns to drive sales. And so it's sort of those three legs of the stool of, of sales, marketing, and data and analytics that are really driving on a day-to-day basis, how we're you know, driving our, our, local, our local revenues on the, on the ticket side. And then on the, on the sponsorship side, it's a little different because there's more of a programming piece to it as well. And so we'll be brought in at times about either what we're doing or what a, a brand will want. And we'll try to create uh, opportunities and for, for these brands to kind of plug into on, on there. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating. I didn't realize that. So it's kind of a challenging CMO role, right? Because it's not like that the you sit at the top of marketing and you just get to kind of like do whatever you want. You there are places in which you can you can uh, expand certain areas and other areas that you know isn't an owned asset. Um, it's a fascinating challenge. Yeah, it is. So the, I was giving an informational interview a couple of weeks ago, and somebody said. Um, you know, my dad said that you've got the easiest job. <laughs> like, you got the easiest job in sports. You know, like it sort of felt like that scene out of airplane, you know, and, and, um, yeah. you know, and, and we're, I yeah, was sort of selfishly, I mean, listen, to be, we have a lot of assets in terms of just, you know, we have a incredible brand and a long history. We have Fenway Park. We've got a great fan base, an incredible corporate base. Boston as a city is, I would say, the best sports town in, in, in the country. So we have a lot going for us. You know, there's, there's, there's no doubt. Having said that, you know, there, there are real challenges there, you know, and, and part of it is, you know, the intensity and the, and the scrutiny on, on every decision is something that, you know, we, we know we embrace and we appreciate because if people aren't looking, you know, then, you know, apathy sets in and that's, you know, we talk about like apathy is kind of a kryptonite for us. And, you know, we're, we're highly focused on, you know, again, how we can kind of push. And I think that's one of the things that have been successful, that how we've been successful is we've never relied and sort of said, Hey, like we've got all this, these assets, so to speak. And, you know, that's good enough. You know, we've always tried to push, you know, whether that's the renovation of Fenway Park, whether that's our community programming, we've got the largest charitable foundation in, in all of sports. You know, what we've done, he said, with you know, the acquisition of Liverpool and our relationship with LeBron James, I mean, we've, we've got a wide swath. And, um, you know, and I think for us, it's always been about, you know, creating championships, driving revenue, impacting the community, and really connecting and building relationships with fans. And that prism, I think, has allowed us to, along with these assets and the success that we've had, has really been the that hasn't changed. You know, that's really been the bedrock of the success. And even with throughout the expansion of Fenway Sports Group, you know, those core principles remain the same. That's, yeah. By the way, huge Liverpool match coming up today. Uh, this will date the episode, but uh, this is a, a big one, Liverpool-Chelsea. Yeah. So I never realized that, and it totally makes more sense now that you look at like EPL, how they market, the, who their sponsors are, how they look at like Leave Pat. Uh, or like jersey patches and 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 all that sort of stuff that totally makes sense uh and it makes sense around you know MLB sponsoring the neighbor neighboring areas it's a fascinating look because then you really have to go so much deeper into the community to find those those partners that uh that are going to be in the surrounding areas not just not just you know global brands um wow that's super interesting i didn't know that yeah, and it's a you know, and it ends up being a, 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 at times a combination, and um, it is really interesting. And I think the trends are also fascinating. You know, we're going to get fans back here this year. 
which is great. We need, you know, we need that uh, fans back. We need that energy back. I think everybody wants that. And hopefully, you know, again, as things become safer and we get more vaccines that that capacity will, will grow and grow. And, you know, I think is it, I'm sure a lot of your other guests have talked about just sort of the accelerating patterns that the, that the pandemic has, has sort of catalyzed, I think are going to be interesting as it sort of plays out. We hopefully at some point sort of return to more normalcy along the way here. So, you know, you mentioned LeBron James. Uh, we talked a little bit about like behind the scenes content and things like that. I know a lot of times like players, agents will, will have, you know, independent production teams that follow them and, and, and things like that. You know, there's so much uh, I think we're we're still kind of in the early innings here of the type of like player driven content and 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 things that can be created. Um, I think there's just a lot more stuff that you know will continue to get iterated on, and obviously with new platforms like TikTok and things like that. And then also you have uh, you know baseball advanced media that uh, you know does a lot of the you know the in game voice and piece pieces like that. Like how do you look at kind of like the Red Sox, like quote unquote brand voice, uh, and keeping that, and not just, you know, and, and Fenway as well, keeping that brand voice consistent versus like working with, you know, the MLB, working with independent agents and, and, and players, uh, and things like that. Yeah. I mean, we were very thoughtful about it. And some of that, there's, you know, we, we've talked about this in other, in other times too, you know, every year, you know, our rosters change, you know, the team that we have this year is different than what it was last year and different, you know, and totally. So there's sort of this challenge of every year you got a new dynamic, new players. And then there's sort of this institution of the Red Sox that doesn't change. You know, it's sort of like the idea of like, okay, you know, hundred year old history, Fenway park, you know, the classic white jerseys, you know, the championships and the curse and, you know, sort of all these things that, or whether you're in Oakland or you're in Boston, you sort of have these the, these sort of textural qualities of of the the brand of of the Red Sox, almost no matter you know no matter who's on the team or, or the year. And we have to balance and sort of focus on both of those. And so, you know, we're really intentional. Like and again, last year we had a really difficult year. I mean, we it was there was not a lot of bright spots during the season, and you know we've got a. We, we talked about that. Like we need to just accept that. Like you're not going to spin, you know, last place finish. Like you're just not going to be able to do that. And you got to have to level with fans and, and even, you know, on, on whether it's on Twitter or Instagram or whatever, especially on Twitter, like you really have to, you know, it's, we talk about like what the personality is going to be. There are things, you know, we do feel like there's a, you know, approach that for us just sort of as a brand that you can't sort of, disassociate sort of like the the feelings that we want fans to have about us at Fenway with how we want people to feel with us on digital you know like like it sort of needs to be for us we feel like it's a connective like there's a connector there and you can't have a split personality totally you know you may be able to say things a little bit differently on digital or you know on Twitter than you would you know, making a PA announcement of some sort at, at the ballpark. Yeah. Yeah. But the essence of it can't be the same, you know, it has to be intact and has to be the same. And for us, you know, other brands, I think have sort of put that to the test and have been, you know, little, like have really pushed the envelope, whether that's sort of, whether internally, you know, with like, you know, the, the LA Kings have always had sort of a, um, you know, really interesting and entertaining and engaging feed and, oh, yeah. you know, and, and, we've sort of said, you know, like, we love that. It's just not, it's not us. And, um, and, but again, like we evaluate that month to month about what, where we can push and where we can grow and, and, you know, and, and we have made adjustments over the years for sure, you know, and, and, but it's, and it's a really interesting sort of debate that we have all the time because we do want to push and, you know, we want to make sure that we're appealing and entertaining you know, at, at all platforms, you know, whether that's, that's rates of ballpark entertainment or whether that's, you know, digital content, but there's also limits. And, you know, from a brand, we've got to assess those. How do you think about younger audiences? How do you think about engaging millennials and Gen Z? You know, like I think a lot of people started 
in baseball, playing t-ball, playing baseball as a as a kid, maybe going to to a game with their their friends or their parents or something like that. You know, it kind of gets us all all started early in that way. But how do you how do you think about marketing to younger generations? Yeah, it's it's critical. It is critical, and there's so many d- different ways that we need to elevate our our efforts. You know, you talked about participation and playing, and and you know, MLB has really done an incredible job. You know, up until the pandemic, you know, the, I think the three years prior was actually the fastest growing major sport as it relates to participation. They've really put a lot of effort and resources into the play ball campaign and, and growing the, the participation. So that's that's a great indicator uh, for baseball. Um, and, you know, having said that, we also know that the competition for hearts and minds and dollars of the next gen, you know, gens has never been greater. And especially as it relates to the last year and you know, when you see the the numbers on on gaming, I mean, it's just in, in esports. I mean, it really is staggering. And I think what we're seeing is we need to have a proliferation of content. Uh, we need to make sure that the players are sort of at the the central piece of that because you know you can see that the the players are really the dominant players on on social and their ability to connect and personalize and have personalized interactions with fans is critical and um so we're doing a lot more with you know with mlb and partnership with mlb trying to put more content on you our youtube platform trying to just create more content mlb is doing a lot more this year on twitch you know that we'll be participating in and just starting to get more and more into that there's a you know and youtube actually has live games this year and that will will be featured in, in one of those games in in april and so i think all of those things, you know, in terms of making sure that we are on devices, we are uh, producing content that is on the platforms that the next gen wants to see, player marketing critical. Um, and you know, the other thing, it's not necessarily over next gen, but it relates to fans right now, is just the sports betting totally. and the and predictive gaming is the, the next big, big wave. And, you know, they've had it it's been legalized in, in Europe uh, for a long time. And just the, especially for a game like baseball, it's such a great opportunity. And the same thing on the content side, I mean, we've had so, you know, we've got games for seven months and, you know, the daily rhythms of that game um, are so important and provide great opportunities for network broadcasts, for content and for sports betting. And, and, you know, and, and in Massachusetts, it's not legal yet. But, you know, we anticipate it at some point, you know, there will be there will be legislation and, and a vote. And, you know, our ability to to really market and engage on a different level, I think, will will be there. So I think those are all factors that are going to be really important for the, the for the next generation and, you know, managing and really using these platforms. And again, going back to the partnerships, you know, on fan connectivity and engagement and data, I think are going to be really, really important. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I started watching EPL more recently. Um, never really had gotten into EPL uh, as it, when I was younger, but like always kind of liked soccer. The biggest thing is just the access to the games. It's like the fact that I can access, like we, I use YouTube TV now, but, uh, but it's like the fact that I can just like, you know, DVR all the games and just watch them whenever I want. Like, it's so much easier to be a fan when you can do that stuff. And then you can just have the game on, you just throw it on in the background all the time. I think that's the thing that like is the key to unlocking younger generations growth into sports. It's just like, can you watch the games on demand whenever you want them? And then for the big games, then you can watch them, you know, at a bar with your friends, you know, whatever, live in person. And I think that 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 is just how people are going to consume. And we just got to got to be ready for that to to kind of capture that value. No doubt. And and not only, you know, again, there's going to be more platforms and more opportunities. I think one thing that we need to do and the commissioners talked about this a lot is we just we need to the game itself needs to to change. You know, the game has changed quite a bit and baseball has changed, but length of game, pace of game, um, you know, balls in play, action, like th- those, there's been some some trends that 
are disturbing, you know, as it relates to the actual game itself. And, you know, we, we need to work with the, with the players to make sure that the game is as exciting as it's ever been, as enticing as it's ever been to fans today and fans tomorrow. And so, you know, not only the, the platforms, but the game itself, you know, provide an opportunity for, for growth. And, um, you know, I know that that's maybe the one of, if not the biggest initiative going on across the industry right now. Okay, let's get into our lightning round. These questions are fast and easy, just like marketing with Salesforce. You can go to salesforce.com slash marketing to learn more about marketing on the world's number one CRM. That is Salesforce. Put your customer at the center of every interaction. Go to salesforce.com slash marketing to learn more. Lightning round questions. Adam, are you ready? Absolutely. Number one, do you have a favorite campaign that you've run uh, over the past couple of years? Well, we had our due damage campaign in 2018. Um, and we ended up winning a World Series, uh, which can't take credit for that as a campaign, but it, that will always always stick with us as 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 one of the fun ones. I love, man. I love the I love the 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 campaigns because I remember being like I said, I was I'm a Warriors fan. So back in the day, the Warriors was like, it's a good timeout. <laughs> it's like just come to the games. It's yeah. fun. I promise. And then you know, by the time the Warriors are winning championships, it's like all strength and numbers and all this like great team and all this stuff. Do damage. That's pretty good. You did some did some serious damage. What do you think when you hear Sweet Caroline? Well, I think the game is almost over. <laughs> and But I also, my dad uh, was the, I, I was raised on Neil Diamond and uh, I'm still going, yeah, and <laughs> my dad was like the biggest Neil Diamond fan in the world. So I guess I always think about my dad too, uh, just out of, out of habit and being exposed perhaps at too early of an age. <laughs> That's hilarious. What's the best seat at Fenway? So I'll answer this two ways. One, you know, if you had one game to be at Fenway, I do think sitting on top of the monster yeah. would be the best. I mean, it just, there's no other seat like it. And it's the biggest literally and arguably figuratively landmark in baseball. And to kind of be on top of the wall watching that, I think is, is awesome. And again, personally, I also think too, with you know John and Tom and and Larry and and Janet Marie Smith and Jonathan Galula who worked you know so hard on those those early years like the audacity and, and I say this in a beloving way like to sort of say hey let's put like our first major renovation of Fenway put seats on top of the the Green Monster like it's such a, it was such a bold move and it was also executed flawlessly and so I just think it's a good reminder of, of vision and possibility. And also it just, it's, it's so fun to be out up there. Do you have a, uh, a big difference between, you know, you spent some time with the dolphins and, and, uh, your Red Sox and then to the dolphins and then, and then back, um, anything you miss about the NFL? Every game was a massive event and that was fun. And I remember my first game with the dolphins at home was, a, a Monday night game against the Colts when Peyton Manning was still was still there. And I remember walking on the field and thinking, this is like uh, an ALCS, you know, I mean, just, yeah. it felt so big. What I don't miss is that, you know, you, you can win more games in a week than we did in, you know, in baseball than we did in, you know, our <laughs> two years at, yeah. at the Dolphins. So we, I was there for three seasons and we won 20 games. So those were long weeks when you had a, a really hard Sunday and you had to wait another week to get back back on the field. That's a great, great, great point. Any uh, any final thoughts here, Adam? This has been awesome having you on. Uh, great to great to chat marketing and baseball. Any other things about about marketing the Red Sox that's uh, that you want to share? No, I think yeah, I I do think just in general over the last year. I mean, we've always known it because we talked about sort of these personal relationships and, and obviously the, the tools of how to grow them and build them and understand fans have changed, but the importance of people as part of sports and fans as part of sports has never been, I think, more apparent than the last year. And, you know, we are, I think it just as a sports industry and I know our organization, we just cannot wait to get people back in and try to get the buzz back that we're all 
we're, we're all clamoring for. So, you know, we know and we believe and hope and know that the next, you know, this next season will be much better on every, every level than, than last. And, you know, for all fans out there, we just appreciate everybody sticking with us and really being part of the sports industry. Cause it's, it's been an incredibly difficult and trying time for everyone associated and we'll be happy to be together soon. Yeah, well, we appreciate uh, you sticking with it and uh, and trying to think of so many new ways to to incorporate the fans and everything. I know sports gets us through some tar- some dark times, and uh, you know it's it's kind of always there when you need it. So it's great that you know it's it's uh, it's going to be back and in full swing here. Pardon the pun, but uh, Adam, awesome! Thanks so much for joining the show. We really appreciate it, and uh, take care. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. Discover marketing built on the world's number one CRM, Salesforce. Put your customer at the center of every interaction. Automate engagement with each customer and build your marketing strategy around the entire customer journey. Salesforce, we bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com slash marketing.